Let's open up in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for this day, Father. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. And we just ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins so we may come to your throne of grace with a righteous mind and a righteous heart. Father God in heaven, we just want to lift you to the highest of the highest mountains, Father, because you are deserving of it. You are the only one deserving of it. Lord God in heaven, for those people who are coming to our hearts and minds, Lord, we just ask that you would just pour your love, pour your grace, pour your mercy, pour your blessings upon us, Father God in heaven. Breathe new life into us. Jesus, we need you now more than ever. You know, we are going down a path, Father, in our country where people are rejecting you. But more importantly, Father, we need to pray that the body of Christ stand together for those things that are going to be coming against us in this world. Lord, you have foretold us that the persecutions will come, and we see this across the globe, and we're seeing it more and more in this country. So, Father, we know that as our King, that we are protected. As our King, we are blessed. As our King, we will be provided for. So our faith is in you and you only. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, those people who are coming to our hearts and minds, please heal them with spiritual healing, with physical healing, with financial healing, and breathe life into each and every one of us so we may develop that close personal relationship that you want to have with us, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to jump into a section of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 through 29, where the Hebrew author is just focused on Moses and the faith that Moses had. And today's title of the message is The Seven Acts of Faith Surrounding Moses. And it's interesting as you break down these verses and you can see every act of faith that Moses had or Moses' parents had. And this is, should be an example to each and every one of us, the faith that we should carry with us every day. And if our faith is weak, we should get in our word and stay in our word to strengthen our faith, to allow God to work in our lives and to build that faith that he wants us to have in him each and every day. And to also open our eyes to those moments where he brings faith into our lives. And we recognize it as God providing, God directing, and God just leading our lives. Those are the things that we're going to discuss today. And it's, it's just an awesome, awesome extension of the faith-building um, scripture that we've been entrenched in for the last month or so in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. It's such a wonderful chapter of faith. Again, as a reminder, you know, we're looking at the Old Testament men and women who had great faith, and we're also going to be taking a look at, you know, the New Testament men and women with great faith as we proceed on. So uh, please, um, Pray about the things as we go through this message that God is putting on your heart. As we discuss, you know, our walk of faith. And as God is pouring into you, just lay all your burdens at his feet. And see how he will work in your lives and how he will change the way you think and perceive what faith is. Uh, through the life of Moses and how he used Moses greatly. And we all know the story, so we'll get there. So last week we talked about Isaac and his family being blessed through the promise of God. So Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph were all men of faith, but we know they were father and son and grandfather and grandson. So that whole faith uh, line 
went from generation to generation to generation. And that's what we discussed last week. How do we pass our faith on to the next generation? And people will say, well, God gives us our faith. Absolutely, God gives us our faith. But through our faith, through the demonstration of our faith, our children and grandchildren will see how strongly we believe in God. And that is the seed that gets planted uh, from generation to generation to generation. So our faith is contagious and our faith can be passed on through generation. And that's what we learned last week, and it was awesome. This week, we're going to see the seven acts, as I mentioned, surrounding uh, Moses and Moses' life and how God used Moses through his faith to uh, build upon what God had planned for the Israelites, his children. Now, we know that Moses uh, waned in a little bit of faith because he went to God on several occasions and said he wasn't worthy. But what did God tell him? God told him that it is not Moses who is going to be doing the speaking. It is not Moses who is going to move the people. God is going to use Moses. But this was God's ultimate plan, and this is God's ultimate call to Moses to be obedient, to be obedient in faith. And before Moses was born, God knew what he had made and what he put into Moses so Moses would carry out God's plan. So if you think you are unworthy of serving the Lord Jesus Christ and serving God the Father, then think again, because Moses thought the same thing. And look how God used him. So each and every one of us have an opportunity to be used by God. Because God builds in us his kingdom. Remember, the Bible teaches us we are the temple where God resides, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives in us. If we are that temple, then God wants to live with us. He wants to live with us in a righteous temple in a faithful temple. And that's what we should be focusing on. Not that we are unworthy or not that we have so much sin in our lives that God cannot forgive us. Remember this, God forgives every sin. God forgives every sin. We need to approach God with a repentant heart. We need to approach God knowing that he is the king of kings, and there is no one greater than him, no one above him, no one above his son. If we believe in his son, if we believe in his son, that his son will get us into the kingdom of heaven, then that's where our faith walk begins. But it doesn't end there, because God, through the rest of our lives, will carry us. So it doesn't matter what sin you've committed in your life. If you have a repentant heart, you seek forgiveness. You forgive those others who have come against you. And you receive the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he is the only way to his Father, as the Bible teaches us. Then you will find your eternal home. So let's get going in our message can you count how many acts of faith you've had in the last month? Can you identify those moments where God was building faith in you? And can you take a step back and you can you acknowledge it? And can you give God the glory for working in your life like that? Are those moments crystal clear to you, identifiable? Are they etched in your mind? Because if you can, you are on the right path. You have the Holy Spirit filled within you. You have a discernment. You can discern what is from God and what is from the world. And as faith God, uh, as God builds faith into us, we should be able to recognize those moments. And we should be able to acknowledge those moments by glorifying our King, our Savior. And giving him the reverence that he's due, that he is due, the reverence that he has already paid for through the cross, through the crucifixion, through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does any single act of faith stand out to you? 
over your whole life? Is there one moment where you were so down or you seen zero hope and all of a sudden things changed? Ch things changed on a dime. And you knew at that moment that God was there. God was guiding. God was providing. God was protecting us. Is there that moment that you can reflect on? Because that is where I would ask you to live, not in the past, but in the moments where we are so desperate that God hears our cries, hears our prayers, and then he builds us. He fills us with a peace of the Holy Spirit, with a peace of Jesus Christ, with the peace of God, with the peace of heaven. We are filled. And at that moment, it is etched in our minds where God has saved us, where God has protected us and provided for us. How many acts of faith do you need to experience before you can believe and trust in God? Do you need 100? Do you need 10? Or do you just need one? to where you know God exists. You know God is going to lead you and protect you and provide for you. How many acts upon acts do you tell yourself, Lord, just one more, just one more act of faith and I'll totally give my life to you? Or do you say 10 more, Lord, 10 more acts of faith and I'll give you a quarter of my life? A hundred and boy, you got my whole life. Are you one of those? who need more proof, more proof, more proof, and more evidence? Or are you someone who can see and read in the Word of God that God is a creator of all things, and we should, we should, we should reverence the Creator, not the created. The created is part of this world. Yes, God created it, but when we reverence the Creator, we are telling God, that there is nothing greater in this world than He. There is nothing greater in this universe than He, because He created all things. So please don't be misguided by reverencing and worshiping the created. We worship the Creator, and we reverence the Creator in all that we do. And we glorify God in everything that we do. That's our focus. That's what we need to focus on. So let's jump into Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. So in verse 23, Hebrews 11, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. In verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And in verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And it's an amazing seven verses for this respect. God maps out every step of the way where Moses had faith or Moses' parents had faith. And we need to reflect on this hard, and we really need to absorb it, and we really need to allow the Jesus through the Holy Spirit to speak to us in these verses and how faith really works in our lives, and how faith can be contagious. Because as we read this scripture, as God has given us the Bible, not only in Genesis and Exodus we read these stories, but also in the book of Hebrews, as a reminder, through our faith, 
we have the word of God that we can lean on and we can understand the faith of these men and women. And through the faith of these men and women and through the blessings that God will pour upon us, our faith can grow as strong. I am convinced of this. Our faith can be as strong as the faith Moses had, as a faith Abraham had, as a faith Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph had, as a faith Sarah had. Our faith can be that strong if we allow Jesus through the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. If we let go of our lives, if we release the pride if we ask the Lord to come in and take our pride, that's what I mean by release it. We have to give it up. There's something that we have to do, and that is give up the things that we so cherish in this world. When we do that and we replace those things with the things of heaven, with the kingdom, with God, with God's promises, our faith can be as strong. I believe that with all my heart, all my mind, and all my soul. So let's break down verse 23. It says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. So God made Moses as he made us, and he knows every hair in our heads, and he implanted us with the ability to serve him. Each and every one of us have the same ability to serve God. That's how he made us. And he made Moses like this. And we're going to see in verse 23 in this supporting verse here, Exodus 2, 1 through 3, And a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife as a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of uh, bull rushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put a child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. Some people will read this scripture and say, well, you know, she didn't have faith because she hid Moses and she, she sent him away. But that's not the case the case is she kept the son her son for three months and then knowing as the pharaoh and the pharaoh's guards were closing in on the hebrews who bore children to kill them she took action god gives us wisdom to take action we have a faith so strong and I will lay it out like this. Her faith was so strong that she knew if she gave her son up and put him in a basket and floated him down the Nile, then God would protect him. And look at the final outcome. Look at how Moses grew up as a child. Look how Moses grew up as a young man. He was protected by the Pharaoh's daughter. He was protected by the Pharaoh himself. He learned the ways of the Egyptians. He was highly educated. Do you think that was happenstance or luck? Or do you think God's ultimate plan was that? And through the faith of Moses' parents, he was able to realize the things that God had planned for his life. And we're able to read them and we're able to study what he is doing what he did in Moses' life through the faith and obedience of his parents. So how can our faith be passed on a generation? We're seeing, seeing witness of it here. Let's look at Exodus 1.16. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Why was a Pharaoh doing this? Because a Pharaoh knew that there would be a king coming from the Hebrew nation. We all knew this. Let's jump over. I, I don't have this. Uh, I want you to open up your Bible, though, to Acts 7, verse 20. And I just want to read this. 
as confirmation. So let me get to, at this time, in verse 20, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. This is the point I want to bring out on this scripture, Acts 7.20. He was well-pleasing to God. When we are well-pleasing to God, God will use us mightily. And I will tell you, God is not selective. He is pleased in all of us. But he will bless us all differently. And through our obedience, our blessings will grow. And this is where your faith needs to come from. God knew who Moses was going to turn out to be. God knows who we are going to turn out to be. But God also gives us opportunity to make the choices to go down the path that he has laid out for us, that righteous path. Or we can take a detour. Or we can just get off the path altogether and never live the life that God has intended for us, to serve him, to be servants, faithful servants of God. Let's look at verse 24. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So this is the second act of faith. He refused to be called the, the uh, son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, what are the implications there? Some people may say, oh, big deal. It was a big deal that you are rejecting not only Pharaoh's daughter, your mother, or your stepmother, or your adopted mother, but you're also rejecting Pharaoh. And what kind of price do you think someone would pay for doing that? But Moses had so much faith when he was old enough to do that, to reject that God started to show him his purpose in life and his servitude for God himself. Moses chose, and it turns out he made the right choice. And it turns out God used Moses in the whole Exodus as an example of faith for us. If you're righteous in God, and God puts a burning desire in your heart, you will never, never go wrong if you are obedient and you are faithful. We have to remember that God can use you if you allow him to, just as Moses was being used. And at the time, in the storm, Moses probably couldn't see clearly. But I guarantee you, when he was on that mountain and he was seeing that burning bush talking to him, he got it at that moment. So here's the message. God will use us. We have to be prepared. We have to start preparing. We have to be willing. And when God speaks to us, we need to move out. And we need to do the things that God asks in faith. In faith. And that's what Moses did. Let's look at a supporting verse here. Exodus 2, 10 and 11. And the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And when he became her son, so she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. In verse 11, now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at the burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew one of his brethren. And there's more beyond 11. There were... 12 verses that I could have picked out, but the point I want to make in these verses here in verse 10, that God brought Moses to Pharaoh's daughter. And then as Moses was grown, as God was speaking to his heart, as God was speaking to him, he went out and he looked at the burdens of the slaves of the Israelites. And it started to weigh heavy on him. And that's when he knew his purpose was something other than being an Egyptian, living in a life of luxury. He had other purpose. And God was going to show him clearly what his purpose was. Let's look at verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Now, what do we think the Hebrew author is telling us about the plas passing pleasures of sin? What kind of passing pleasures of sin are you engaged in in the world today? Because that is exactly where the Hebrew author is going to the 
the Jewish community and also the Christian Jewish community that, and the Gentile community that he is preaching this message to. There are so many passing pleasures in this world that we can attach ourselves to that have absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom of God, absolutely nothing to do with building our faith in God, in the kingdom. They have everything to do with separating ourselves from God. They have everything to do with building our faith in the world and in ourselves, which is diametrically opposed to where God wants us to be by the way. And when we recognize that, then we can ask the Lord through the Holy Spirit who resides in us, who lives in us, to start to change the way we think, start to change the way we speak, start to change the way we act. Because God wants us on that righteous path. Let's look at verse 26. Before I go there, uh, go to 26, I want to bring this up. So what is the act of faith in verse 25? He decided to suffer affliction with the people of God because he knew at some point that the suffering with God is going to outweigh the pleasures of the world. So that was his act of faith. And that's what we have to remember. When we live with God, sacrificing the things in this world does not matter. We need to sacrifice the things of the world that matter to God. That's why fasting and praying is so important, by the way. Because we're making that sacrifice. We're sacrificing only for the moments that God has us fasting and praying. That we are bringing the burdens that really God is asking us to pray for. And we're showing how important God is to us by going through that fasting and praying. Our choice is always to live in comfort. Human nature, who would not want to live in comfort? I mean, think about it. Who would rather live in a miserable state all the time? And I'm not saying that as you become a Christian, it's miserable. I contend that as you come, become a Christian, your life becomes more fruitful. It becomes more meaningful. And you have more joy and you have more peace in your life as a Christian. Yes, the persecutions will come, but the Bible promises us that those burdens are not unsurmountable, meaning that Jesus can take every burden away from us and fill us with that peace and that love. And that's what we have to recognize. So is it a choice of comfort in a world or the love, the mercy, and the grace of Christ in the kingdom of heaven, knowing that we'll be persecuted? But through faith, God will take us through those enduring moments. So let's look at uh, verse 26 now. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So what did he do here? He looked towards the reward. You know, uh, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than a treasure. So he was forced to make a choice. And the choice that he made was, I will choose God. I will choose suffering with God's people over everything that he had in Egypt. Remember, he was wealthy. He was the stepson of Pharaoh, or the adopted son of Pharaoh, grandson. Think about that. His lineage that he gave up to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father God. Think about how much faith he had to have to give up those things. And that's what God asks us to do. Now, are we all sons and daughters of the Pharaoh or of the king or of the president? No. But there are things in our lives God is asking us to give up. In faith, knowing that when we give them up, God has something greater, much, much greater for us in the rewards if we look forward to the rewards in the kingdom of heaven. 
And we need to be reminded of that as we go through our walk, as we endure some of the things of the world, as we turn away and we allow Jesus through the Holy Spirit to separate us from the world. We're going to live through some harsh times. We're going to be called harsh names. We're going to be persecuted. We may even be physically attacked. But you know what? If we endure through the end, as the Bible teaches us, from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, endure through the end because the reward in heaven is greater than anything that this earth has to offer. Let's look at a supporting verse. Hebrews 13, 13. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his report approach. Now, why does a Hebrew author use this particular verbiage in describing Jesus? Because Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem. Moses built a tabernacle outside the camp to go to Jesus. And what the Hebrew author is telling us is we need to separate ourselves from the world, the riches of the world, as Jesus was separated, that the rituals, the things of the world, the things that we hold dearly need to go away. We need to go outside of the world's camp, and we need to go where Jesus lives. And we need to understand that when we go there, when we make that transformation, the riches that God has for us are going to be greater and greater and greater than we can ever imagine. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4.17. Paul teaches us, For our light affliction, which is out, which is but, I'm sorry, for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And again, it's another reminder that things that we are giving up in this world are nothing compared to what we're gaining in the kingdom of heaven. And Paul puts it like this, the afflictions that we will suffer, the light afflictions, he says, the light afflictions, some are heavy, some are burdensome, but you know what? Those afflictions are nothing compared to what God has for us in the glory, when we are in our glory states, when we are glorified by the Lord Jesus Christ and we're living with him in heaven. Let's look at verse 28. Before I get there, let me just bring up, not fearing the wrath of the king. Oops, I'm so sorry. Uh, verse 27. I believe we're in. Yes. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So, in this verse, what is his faith move? His faith surrounding or act of faith was not fearing the wrath of the king. He knew. He knew he would suffer by Pharaoh's hand. A, he committed a murder, so he was going to die by the hand of Pharaoh. But as God started to use him and started to bring him in front of the Pharaoh, God bring Moses in front of the Pharaoh. Moses knew that he was on a very short rope, and Pharaoh at any moment could have killed Moses. But we know Moses was protected by God. And Moses knew he was protected by God. And through his faith, he was greatly obedient. And who is the question, would you rather suffer from the world or from God's wrath? It's a simple answer for Christians. It's a simple answer for us who know who God is and the wrath and have seen the judgments and read the judgments and the wrath of God. God's ultimate judgment is he will judge you and you will be cast into the lake of fire. And why are you judged like that? Because you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. You reject God himself. 
and you openly admit it to the whole world because you're so proud to reject God. You're one of these people who will stand on a mountain and say, Lord, I don't know you. I reject you. I don't believe in you. And God says, fine. If you continue that thought process, you will be judged. You will be judged harshly. You will end up in the lake of fire. But through God's grace and God's mercy, what will he do? He will give you opportunity to change your opinion, change your mind, change your life through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Receiving Jesus, believing with all your heart that you want to live your life and give your life to them and serve the God the creator of all things, and not serve the created. Let's look at Exodus 10, 28. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take heed to yourself and see my face no more. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. Well, Moses said, Okay, bring it. My God is my protector, and there is nobody greater than my God. There is no army that can come against my God, my God, Yahweh, my God, Jehovah. My Father in heaven, his Son, Jesus Christ, no one. No one can come against God. No one, nothing. There isn't a spaceship or an alien in existence that can come against our God. There isn't a vaccine or any other mental twisting and lies that can come against our God in heaven. There is nothing created that can compare to our God in heaven. He created all. Let's look at Verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And so by faith, as God was telling the Israelites to put the blood of the lamb over the doors to protect them, so the Spirit, the Holy Spirit would pass over them, the whole purpose of the Passover, correct? Moses was obedient. Moses was faithful. He did the things that God asked him to do. And he also put the Passover. So what is this act of faith? He sprinkled the blood. He kept inside because he knew God was going to judge. And this is a testimony of heaping coals. Because Pharaoh ordered every firstborn Hebrew son to be killed. And what does God do in his judgment? I will take the firstborn of the Egyptians. And God proved through that act that he is greater than Pharaoh. Because there were some Hebrew sons that were never found. Moses is a great example of that. Pharaoh's reach could not extend far enough to reach every Hebrew son. But God's reach did. And every firstborn Egyptian, unless you were put in with the blood of the lamb over your door, was going to die and did die. So what is the act of faith? knowing that when God promises something, God delivers. Let's look at some supporting verses here. Exodus 12, 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And Ma, uh, God is speaking into Moses and Moses is speaking into the people. And Moses is not in exclusive of himself as God is speaking. He includes himself in this scripture because he knows God's promises are going to be true. 
and he has to be aware of that. Let's look at verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Now this is amazing. What is the act of faith here? Pass through the Red Sea as by dry land. So who would think, who would have thought that you're bringing thousands of Israelites through the desert, you get to the Red Sea, all of a sudden you're looking out and you're seeing no way to get through. You have horses, donkeys, you have carts, you have children, women, elderly. And Moses is looking out and he's saying, how do I get from point A to point B? And God says, don't worry. I am control. I am in control of all things. I control the wind, the seas, the land, even the birds in the air, the flowers in the field. God controls these things. So in faith, what does Moses have to do? He was asked to raise his staff. He was asked to have the people go through the dry bed, river bed, or lake bed, or ocean bed, however you want to view what the Red Sea is. And let's look at a supporting verse. Then Moses stretched out his hands over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. Listen, all that night. It wasn't just for the moment. God wasn't playing games here. He gave the people enough time to believe that God was going to protect them. He did it all night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. Can you imagine if the sea was 50 feet deep, how high would the divide have to be of water for people to go down 50 feet, walk across and go up? Hundreds of feet. For people to see that, I'm sure it was quite scary. But I'm sure as people were crossing through, other people's faith started to grow, saying, you know what? God is not playing around. God is not playing games. God is giving us an opportunity to go through the Red Sea. And you can see how contagious faith is. One goes, two goes, three goes, a hundred goes, thousands go. Let's look, Exodus 14, 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea that waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and their horsemen. So as the last Israelite gets to the other side, on the other bank, and they're looking back, and they see the Egyptians following, what does God tell Moses? Release. And what does God do? He releases the water. He releases the wind. The water comes pouring down on every Egyptian, just as God planned it. Because Moses was faithful, because Moses was obedient, God's plan was executed. And executed, I would say, flawlessly. But there was grumblings along the way and things like that. We know the story. I don't have to go into that. But God took his people out of Egypt, delivered them on the other side of the sea, and smite down the enemies of his people. Within a matter of days, God did that. So God's promise came quickly and swiftly. And we don't understand or see that. So let's look at some encouraging verses here. Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory of God, the glory of heaven. The glory of the blessings that God has when we are faithful. And this is Paul again saying the sufferings in this present time do not compare. There's no comparison to what we will suffer in this world. 
for the riches, against the riches that are going to be waiting for us in heaven. I will tell you this. If you choose to reject the Lord Jesus Christ, the suffering that you will receive in the lake of fire will be greater than you could ever imagine. Be greater than you can ever imagine. So don't make that choice. Choose God. Choose to be blessed by God. Choose to be protected by God. Choose to be driven by God. Choose to give your life to God. There's nothing else that we can do. So let's go into our conclusion. There are so many things that happen in our lives that we would consider luck or have no explanation for. If we are focused on God, we will see that in the kingdom of heaven there is no luck, no happenstance. It is all God's control to guide us, period. It is all in all God's control to provide for us, period. It is in all God's control to protect us, period. If God is asking you to do what you perceive to be impossible, know this, that God knows it is possible. He is asking to stretch you to believe, to stretch your faith. When we take the step of faith that God is offering and act upon it, our faith will grow. It will be implanted in our hearts and etched in our minds. Let's look at Matthew 14, 29. So he said, come. This is Jesus saying, come. And he's talking to the apostles. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And for a few short steps, Jesus was commanding Peter to walk on water. He actually invited all the apostles. Peter was the only one with strong enough faith. At that moment, strong enough faith to get out of the boat and to walk on the water. But what happens, we know the rest of the story. The wind kicks up, the waves kick up. Peter loses his focus on Jesus and starts to drown. And what is the story that we need to extrapolate from that message? Do not lose focus on God, no matter where you're at in your life, no matter where you are in your walk. Do not lose focus on God. Stay focused on Him. He will continue to build your faith. Your faith will grow when you're focused on him. Once we take our focus off Jesus and put it somewhere else, we then lose our faith. This is seen by Peter and the other apostles. It's clear that everyone is called to get out of the boat. Everyone. But only a few will take the act of faith and do it. God wants us out of the boat and doing what we perceive is impossible so he can show us what is possible through him. Our choice should always be to do the possible with God instead of focusing on the impossible of the world. It is through our faith in Christ that carries us and instills us the endurance we need, instills in us the endurance we need to be followers of him, to step out and be fully committed to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the linchpin for our obedience. We can say it the other way too. Obedience is our linchpin for stronger faith. Knowing when we are obedient, we will please God. And at this time, we want to close in prayer. But I also want to invite you, if you've never had faith, if your faith is waning or you're constantly weaving in and out of your faith, let's pray this together and let's join together as a single body of Christ going to God with our petitions and ask the Lord to build in us the faith that he built in Moses and the other Old Testament men and women, and New Testament men and women, and men and women of every century who show 
and display their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's unlimited to who God will use in the kingdom of heaven. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we ask you, Jesus, to build faith into us, Lord God in heaven. I don't know how to build faith, Father, but I know you do. And I know if I give my life to you, if I repent of my sins, Father, if I seek forgiveness for my sins, if I seek to forgive those who sin against me, Father, if I receive your Son, Jesus Christ, as a Lord and Savior, and believe that he is the only way to the kingdom of heaven, I will have a mansion with you. My faith will grow. My faith will continue to grow until that day that you call us home and we are in a glory state with you, Father. And I just want to pray these things, Lord. And I want to give my heart to you. I want to give my life to you. Because there's only one choice, and that is the lake of fire or eternity in a mansion in heaven. And Father, I choose heaven. So if you prayed that prayer in Jesus' name, the Bible teaches us that in Jesus' name, in the will of God, Jesus will give us those things. And thank you very much for praying. Thank you very much for having faith that as you live your life for Christ, we will come against trials and tribulations, no doubt. But we know our King, our Lord, our Savior will be with us every step of the way, carrying us through most trials, pushing us along, nudging us along through some, and letting us go by ourselves through others to build our faith. But God will never forsake us. He will never leave us. And he will never, 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 never forsake us, ever. But he will allow us to go through trials to build us. To be the righteous men and women and children that he wants us to be for one day to be glorified. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have a blessed day. I hope you have a blessed week and a blessed rest of your life. And as a reminder, if you need a Bible, please reach out to us, Love, Truth, and Spirit Ministries. We will send you a Bible. Send me an email. Send me a text. Call me. Go up on our website and request a Bible. We will get that out to you as soon as we get the request, as soon as humanly possible. And if you need other prayer, please lean on our ministry. We are a ministry based on prayer. Our prayer life is strong in this ministry. And I want to tout that somewhat because God pours into us what's important. And praying for others is extremely important, especially in this time. So please reach out to us. So have a blessed week. Have a blessed day. And may the Lord just continue to pour blessings into you. God bless you. Amen.